Hi, and welcome to episode 202 of the Untethered Podcast. Today, we have Dr. Courtney Donko joining us. Dr. Donko is a dentist with special interest in craniofacial growth and development. She strives to understand how environmental and lifestyle factors influence the structure of our faces and jaws. Much of her professional focus is dentofacial orthopedics in children. Dr. Donko's practice is located in the Western Chicago suburbs. Quick disclaimer, all information, content, and material of this podcast are the opinions of the speakers and is for the informational purpose only and not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified healthcare provider. Welcome to the Untethered Podcast. I am your host, Hallie Balkin. I'm a certified orofacial myologist, feeding specialist, and mentor. This podcast is all about getting your questions answered and collaborating with colleagues to bring you the most up-to-date information in the orofacial myofunctional therapy, tethered oral tissue, and airway space. I challenge you to keep an open mind and join my mission to get this information out to the masses. Let's get started. Courtney, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I'm a little... Um, surprised I'm here actually because I've, I've I've listened to some of your other guests I'm like yeah I know them I know some so you've had some of the celebrities of the airway world on um so I'm just uh I'm really humbled to be part of it well I think it's really fun to cross paths with different providers on social media and then I I hear names through colleagues and you know for me it's less about like how famous or you know celebrity somebody is and more so like the changes that you guys are all making in their lives. And I, I know like just from following your account on Instagram, I was like, oh, we've got to get you on the podcast. Like this is, you know, you're doing incredible work. I just love, I love everything you're sharing. So, you know, I, I kind of put you up there on a pedestal with a lot of these others. So, so anyways, um, I always, I usually start with asking people how they got into this space, but you had sent an article because we always ask for any interesting articles with our speakers. You had sent an article, article on mandibular rotation revisited and like what makes it so important. And when I, that, when that popped into my inbox, I was like, I keep hearing this term come up. And, you know, I know I've heard it from several individuals who've been on the podcast, who have, you know, taught that I've, I've attended trainings with, but I want to start there because I don't think our listeners have a grasp on what mandibular rotation is, what it means, what the implications are. So I want to turn it over to you and kind of let you as the expert on, you know, this, because this is out of my wheelhouse, um, share with us, you know, if you can start with what mandibular rotation is and, and why we need to know about it, why it's so important, I think that'd be really help, helpful. Yes. Yeah. I, I will absolutely go there. If you don't mind if I back up just a little bit. Yeah, before that. So the article I sent you was a 2014 article by Peter Boucher. Um, mm -hmm. And he does a lot of research uh, at Texas A&M in the orthodontic department. So I would encourage anyone to read some of the Boucher literature to better understand facial growth and development. Um, so that said, I've always, since I was in dental school, been interested in, in growth and development of the faces and, and interested in anthropology and things like that. So approach, you know, now the, the air, so I graduated dental school in 2014 and, you know, there is a discussion on airway at this point, you know, um, and a lot of, you know, thought leaders in that community are talking about maxillary growth and development. And they're talking about alterations in the oral posture that lead to the maxilla not growing as wide as it ought to and um, being more oriented in a lower position. So more of this vertical growth. And then the, you know, the downstream implication of the mandible growing with a more downward or a backward rotation. And that was my, that was my entry level introduction into, you know, the general, you know, thought behind this facial growth. And uh, I think that those are really important points, but I think that's not the entirety of the story. Uh -huh. So fast forward a few years, uh, I'm introduced to another group, um, a very, very TMJ focused group. And 
the there's a lot of discussion here on the structure of the TMJ and alterations of that structure. So things like disc displacements and um, condylar resorption or erosion of the condylar bone. And the discussion amongst this group primarily revolves around the sequence of a disc becoming displaced due to ligament stretching or tearing. Um, typically, there's a lot of talk about macro trauma, whiplash injuries and compression injuries, uh, you know, to the chin, uh, car accidents, things like that. Disc becomes displaced, condyles overloaded, condyle sails to, to achieve proper growth dimensions. And now we have a short ramus length and a kind of down swung mandible and the maxilla follows suit. Mm. So kind of two, two different, you know, ideas on, you know, what's, what's going on, you know, um, I want to say, I hate, I hate to make divisions and put people on say camps. I really do. But the, you know, this kind of, uh, airway philosophy where for breathing, leads to this altered oral posture, you know, leads to this more vertical growth, narrow growth pattern versus trauma leads to joint injury, leads to poor mandibular growth. Again, leads to this same type of growth pattern where it is narrow and retronath. Okay. So those, and, and, and I'm trying to put all this together, you know, and there are some people that say, well, do we care about the etiology? Let's just treat it. I'm like, I care, I care about the etiology because I'm really interested in, in babies and toddlers and children. And, um, is any of this preventable, you know, can, yeah. can, is there something we could do? So, um, I, I really got focused on trying to consume anything I could to to teach me more about both um, enter mandibular rotation. So a lot of the discussion in that Duchenne literature and he, he references a lot of York literature is the, the pattern in which the mandible is growing. So I think all of your viewers know that Unlike the maxilla, the mandible has no suture, and so it doesn't grow intrinsically. Uh, the mandible changes size and shape from infancy to adulthood by remodeling at the border. So along the, the border of the mandible, so the lower border here, the posterior aspect of the ramus, you know, up at the condyle, there's areas of bone resorption and there's areas of bone deposition as the mandible grows. And, um, you know, that, that pattern looks different in different individuals. So, for example, the individual that has more of a prominent chin and more of a square jaw lines, you know, the, um, the more attractive, you know, face, if you will, typically those types of growers, they their mandibles have grown with a more of a of an upswing or a forward rotation, as we call it. Some would say um, a counterclockwise growth pattern. Um, when you study that growth pattern, you'll notice that, for example, the condyle grows with a different trajectory as compared to the individual has that has a retronasic mandible, more of this downswing in vertical growth, a very retrusive chin. So the good grower, that condyle actually grows with a superior and an anterior trajectory. So the condyle grows up and forward. That elongates the ramus and lowers the mandible. And then there is also lowering of the fossa in which the condyle sits in through growth of that cranial base. Um, and, and it's just remarkable when you start looking at the, you know, the different patterns of growth. And we, most people talk about condylar growth, but most people aren't making any type of distinctions between 
like growing with a, with a posterior trajectory or an anterior trajectory. So, you know, to contrast that good grower, the, the people that we see that many times have compressed pharyngeal airways and, um, very, you know, little chin projection and long, lower facial thirds because of maximum. Oftentimes you see that condylar growth in the condyle gets taller superiorly, but, but toward, grows towards the posterior aspect mm. of that sauce. Um, and so I, I think that that literature, at least for me reading it, like it took a long time to sink in and then understand like, okay, well, how do, you know, how do I see that? Because many times in classical orthodontics, when we want to do comparisons from one time point to another, we'll take two lateral cephs and superimpose them on the SN line. So the anterior cranial base. And um, I learned that to assess the change of the mandible, that's not a good superimposition. And that really the mandible should be superimposed on structures in the mandible that, you know, are, are, are kind of static or stable over time. Um, back decades ago, when Bjork was doing his studies, he drove metal implants into the body of the mandible. Um, uh, you can't really do those same types of studies today. And so, um, Stable structures are often, you know, the uh, inferior alveolar nerve, the border of that, um, the anterior border of symphysis. So to superimpose the mandible, then you can you can see change more reliably over time. Of course, now today we have cone CT and three dimensional imaging technology, um, which you know definitely can change how we visualize things. But um, I would say that you know trying to understand natural growth and, and good growth of the face has revolutionized my thought process as a provider. I mean, I think it's incredible. And I, you explain things so beautifully, like it just, I mean, I know there's a lot of like medical terminology in there, but for somebody who's in this space, you know, the examples you give and the direction that you explain to dogs growing versus how we want it to grow, the mandible in particular. Um, I think it's very helpful to even understand both schools of thought because my first, you know, my first reaction to you even saying that was, okay, well, what if both are true? Like, what if both are contributing to this? What, if, you know, how do, how do we determine that? Because shouldn't yeah. that also impact our approach? Like, don't we want to know, like you said, you want to know the etiology so we know if we can, we want to know if we can prevent it, but also treating the root cause. I think having a better understanding and maybe in certain patients, we never will truly know like what came first, the chicken or the egg, like why, right. right. You know, but you know, I think it does influence our treatment plans sometimes depending on the patient. So, you know, that kind of takes me to my next question is now that you've, you've kind of taken this deep dive into this space and, you know, I know there's still so many questions to be, you know, asked and answered, even as a provider, I'm sure. Um, what is your approach? How has it changed your approach or, or how have you taken, you know, an approach from the beginning to address this and make sure that that mandible is, you know, in a healthy place for that patient? Because, you know, as a, as a provider, a speech pathologist, a feeding therapist, a myofunctional therapist, you know, I'm, I see patients where there's so many different schools of thoughts around what appliances to use and what treatment plan to follow and what comes first and what should be next. And, I always go back to, well, if we're here, you know, if we're concerned about where the mandible's sitting, right? And the mandible's sitting too far, it's too, you know, it's retronathic. Um, like you said, it's compressing on that pharyngeal airway space. If we've got these issues at hand, why are we only focused on the maxilla? You know, and, and that's not everybody, but that's some providers. And then there's others who say, oh, if you treat the maxilla, the mandible will follow. And then there's providers who, you know, my provider for my children down here, um, so we moved about a year and a half ago and we went into additional early expansion for my kids. You know, her whole plan did talk about like the placement of the mandible. So while we're doing certain expansion, forward growth, you know, lateral growth and expanding on three planes, we also need to pay attention to where the mandible is sitting during this process. And so, yeah, I'm just super curious to hear, you know, what your approach is and, you know, how this has really influenced that functionally day-to-day -day practice. Sure. Yeah. Well, gosh, thanks for asking my opinion. I certainly 
don't have all the answers. And and I don't know that anyone does. And I've always said you can never have one guru. Um, so I've certainly taken things from, you know, all my mentors and people I've attended continuing education with um, to try to put it all together. So, you know, I think, you know, the root of your question is like, how, what's my treatment approach or how do we help support the best growth and development of our young ones that we can. Um, so, so certainly, you know, transverse expansion has become a, a really widely used and important tool uh, when treating a, a lot of kids' growth patterns. Um, but the, the, the width or the transverse component, while it's very, you know, popular to address that, it is, it's not the the only component of growth that's important, you know, this, this vertical component and controlling that is, is extremely important as well as trying to, to drive a more anterior growth pattern as well. Um, so I don't know that it's, you know, only one thing or, you know, completely within the, the practitioner of the dental facial orthopedics. I don't know if it's completely within their control. Um, but when talking about mandibular growth, you know, and trying to, like I said, control it or support it, um, I do want to, you know, bring in the discussion of functional appliances. There's a million different functional appliances. I, some common names are Herbst, uh, Twin Block, um, Mara. Essentially, the typical, you know, functional appliance whether it be fixed like a Herbst or removable, you can take it in and out like a twin block. Uh, it's typically something that's interarch. So there's one component that has anchorage on the, the maxilla or, or the maxillary molars, maxillary teeth. And there is a component that, you know, is, is anchored on the lower. And so the mandible is pushed forward or protruded forward by leverage that's gained from, from the upper jaw. And so most people who have used functional appliances or, you know, read literature on them will pretty much agree that there is usually some distalization or kind of pushing back of the, you know, either the, the maxillary dentition, some will say the maxilla as a whole, but some type of distalization because your anchorage is there as we are kind of pull, pulling the, the mandible forward. Well, I'm somebody who um, bought a practice that has quite a legacy of TMJ imaging, which I've adopted a lot of that. So I, I've seen hundreds of combing CTs and MRIs of TMJs in, in multiple positions. And so, um, you know, what do we know when we, protrude someone's mandible forward a few millimeters. You can watch that condyle come down the articular aminence and, and out of the, out of the fossa. Uh, holding the condyle in that position, you know, by means of a Herbst, et cetera, for, you know, six to 12 months, what kind of growth pattern does the condyle exhibit? Well, typically that more superior and posterior type of growth that was the growth pattern I was talking about earlier. That's associated with more of a, of a vertical, more of a downward rotation of the mandible. So not only do we have the potential distalization of the, of the maxillary teeth, but we are also maybe not creating such a favorable growth pattern for the mandible, even though that is the goal of many of these functional appliances. Um, like I said, particularly a, a herbs, but I don't want to, you know, get focused on a certain name. Um, is that we have a retronathic mandible. We have a class two relationship, right? Where the mandible is further set back. And we're trying to correct that class two. Um, and you often can achieve class two correction with a functional appliance, but it's not having a positive effect on the skeletal growth, on the, on the, the type of skeletal growth pattern that we want. 
it's it's achieving more of a dental alveolar compensation. So um, have I used functional appliances before in my practice? Yes, I have. Do I think I'll use a functional appliance again? Probably not. Um, and so you said, you know, how has this changed your treatment approach? Well, I'm trying to understand how good growth happens naturally, you know, without intervention and then try to, to replicate that. So I will say that Simon Wong is someone that's been quite influential in some of my thought process. Uh, so in terms of, you know, supporting good mandibular growth and how his treatment pro how my treatment approach may be, you know, altered is I think that the support of the myofunctional therapist of the, you know, that type of person working with the patient is so important because I am convinced that good oral resting posture has a massive effect on mandibular rotation and mandibular growth. And I was so tickled when I would read these studies that are published in notable orthodontic journals talking about mandibular posture. Um, there's another one, Haley, I have to send to you after this. And um, it comes from this, my dental school, University of Iowa. Um, now it's a non-human study. It was, it was done on, on pigs, uh, but it's still, you can still learn a lot from it. What they did with piglets is they um, fixated the maxilla um, to the, the bone superior to it. So basically they fixated across the suture. So the maxilla could not grow vertically anymore. They limited the, the vertical growth of the maxilla by plating hardware across the sutures. And they studied the effect on the mandible. And what they found was these piglets. And of course, pigs, this is a great control group because you have the same environment. You can feed them the same diet. You know, you can control them a little better than human. And the effects on the mandible in the piggies that their maxillas were not allowed to grow vertically any longer was they had smaller gonial angles. They had more of an up swing um, in the mandible. They were the forward rotators. Um, so, you know, those, those types of things are, are just fascinating. So I am a little off track, but no, no, I think it's, I think that's amazing and really interesting to hear about, even if it's, you know, on a, a little set of pigs, uh, a little piglets, because it's, it's still anatomy, it's still growth. And it still, I think, gives us some insight into what would happen, you know, if we had a human sample that we, we try all this on too. Um, I think it's really, I think it's really fascinating. So I guess kind of to sum it up is, um, I, I, people talk about, do you expand the mandible? Do you not? I, I often do expansion um, of the lower arch. I do. Um, but I think maintaining a good oral posture with the teeth and light contact, the posterior part of the tongue up against, sealed up against the palate and the lips closed, um, and how the, the muscular slings of the masseters and the temporalis muscle hold the mandible up. I, I think that is a, a powerful thing as far as trying to promote good mandibular growth. So, so and I might have missed this, but which appliances do you use or do you recommend then to achieve this? Okay. Yeah. Great question. Um, so I will say I, I try to be appliance agnostic and I think there is no one size fits all. Uh, so in my practice, I do frequently use a bioblock and, you know, everyone has their own little version of, you know, this appliance, but I, I would just say it's a removable acrylic based appliance. Um, and I use that frequently. I also sometimes use a, a fixed, uh, appliance. So like a RPE rapid palatal expander, if someone say high racks, um, I use both of those, um. And, you know, it's kind of a, I make my decision based on, you know, the compliance of the patient, based on the compliance of the family. Um, there are a few other factors too. But what I do like about the, the bio block or the removable acrylic based expander is if it's well made and, you know, you, you are pretty good with the techniques, you can have it function 
almost like a fixed expander in that um, there's really no play. You know, you can get them extremely retentive. And I think that's where sometimes removable expanders um, maybe get a bad name, you know, in that they're, there's a little rock to them or a little wobble or they're not super retentive. Um, and you don't have this, you know, kind of rigid uh, fixation as you would with a cemented appliance. And so some will say, well, you're not getting as much sutural expansion when we're talking about the maxilla, or you're you're just you're you're getting more tooth tipping, you know, when you when you have those. Um, and I think it definitely does depend on the how well made the appliance is and how um, skilled the practitioner is that's using it. But what I do like about those appliances are is the control of the front teeth. So I, I treat many children in the primary dentition and the early mixed dentition. Um, and, and many children that I see not only need transverse width, but there is a component in the anterior that is incorrect. So many times I'll, I'll see four or five, six year old that have an extremely deep bite. So when they bite down, you don't see any of the lower front teeth, extremely deep overbite. Um, and that was my youngest. Yeah. My four-year-old. Right. That's very undesirable in terms of growth. So if you have something fixed in there, maybe you turn with a key, you can get really good lateral development. Um, but it can be hard to open up that deep bite. Um, and so sometimes I've on those, I've started using like little whip arms that lie behind the anterior teeth, you know, to try to bring them out forward. But those are very hard to activate in an appliance that's fixed in the mouth, that's cemented in. You try to get in there with a little prong, you know, little pliers to bend it. Um, and so that's something I've really liked about BioBlock is, is just the control that you can have with your wire bending. Because every three weeks when you see that patient, you can take it out and make some adjustments. Um, so, you know, that's kind of talking about some of this position here. And um, for, for some patients uh, that do need more support with their good oral posture, I do like to use a BioBlock Stage 3. And um, what that is, is it's an appliance that goes on, is worn on top and it has plastic or acrylic flanges that hang down and they make contact with the floor of the mouth. And you can think of this as a habit appliance or penalty appliance because you, you adapt acrylic on, so you do this chair side um, onto those phalanges and then you position your patient with this, you know, closed mouth posture. And when they're wearing the appliance with maintaining that posture, it's relatively comfortable. When they start to open the mouth, a few millimeters, those flanges will engage and make contact with the floor of the mouth and, and dig in, and it will be uncomfortable. So it's a, it's a penalty appliance or a habit appliance to train the child to use their musculature to keep the mouth closed. Um, so there's not anchorage. In other words, like the lower jaw is not fixed to, to the upper jaw. Um, it's not connected, but it's using your musculature to maintain that closed mouth posture. It's so interesting. And do you find that these children respond really well to it? Like it really does like habituate, right? Like once they don't need the appliance anymore and they kind of graduate from that, assuming maybe they're also engaged in myofunctional therapy, um, yes. do you find that that's very helpful in maintaining those new healthier habits? You know, I, I think the tolerance of each child can be very, very different. Um, and it's interesting, like different types of oral habits um, and, and anatomy, I find have tolerate things different, better or worse. Um, so, you know, if we're just talking about expanders, for example, I have a couple of children recently who have had uh, a grade four tongue tie or um, a lingual frenum that's attached very, very close to the tip. Hmm. Um, and their lower expanders, they often they'll get their tongue down underneath of the acrylic, pop it up, pop it out. 
And, you know, they just want to keep popping it no matter how tight I make it. And then I have some children um, who, you know, don't have that anterior attachment of the freedom. Um, you know, they, they're just they're different kids. And, you know, their parents, you know, after the first several weeks of wearing expanders, like, oh, the lower one is perfect. It's rock solid. It stays in place. It never comes out, you know. Um, and, you know, and then I have some that are like, oh, he just pops it out all the time. Where it always lifts. The tongue is always lifting it. And I'm like, they're made the same way. I'm doing the same thing. You know what I mean? And so yeah. the, the behavior and the oral patterns that individuals have um, really make a big difference on how well they tolerate one thing compared to another thing. Uh, and that's why the support of therapists or SLPs or, um, you know, that, that teach these skills of pattern and motor function and rest posture and breathing is, it's incredibly important. I mean, like if you can do nothing else, do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> yeah. I think bio is important too. Yeah. No, I think it's very interesting. And it's, it's this conversation that comes up a lot too with, you know, parents that say, well, what do I do first? Do we, do we come to you first and do an evaluation? Do we go to the uh, dentist and get the CV, you know, CT and figure out like what, cause we know there's probably, a, there may be a tie or there may not be, there may be, you know, we definitely know our child needs some kind of expansion, but we don't know where that's going to begin. What's first. And you know, I am biased in the sense that I say, well, we like to see you baseline. We like to see you before anything else changes in your mouth. So we know what's going on right now. And that way we can, you know, when you come to us, like, let's say we do an eval and then we hit pause, we refer you to, you know, the dentist or whoever the practitioner is we're referring you to. And let's say you go into an appliance and maybe there isn't enough space just yet for your tongue to truly rest up in the roof of your mouth. Um, maybe we're going to go through a month of expansion and then you're going to come back and start sessions with us, you know, and so we have some more room or sometimes appliances, depending on the appliance, may not even allow for the tongue up in the palate yet. So, and then there's cases where we start the Mayo right away and, you know, and then they go into an appliance down the road and then they have a release. And sometimes that looks like it's a different order too. You know, it's, there's no, I always tell everybody, like you said, it's, there's so many variables, so many different presentations. It's truly patient individualized as well as the parents are going to have, you know, an idea of what they want to do first and second as well, regardless of what we may recommend, which I'm sure you'll run into as well. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I guess my, my question here is, you know, do you have any thoughts on like the best first step? Like, would you prefer they come see you first and then you help determine like who they should go see next? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, ideally, I like it if the patient has already had an assessment and been working with a myofunctional therapist, SLP type of person. Um, because, and, and I just, I'm going to plug the people in my area that I work with, but they're amazing. Those patients that come to me because they were referred by their SLP, their therapist, they come in educated. They come in, you know, just like with this kind of baseline foundation and it makes everything I do so much easier. Even the exam so much easier in terms of depressing the tongue to visualize the tonsils, you know, having them elevate their tongue, things like that. Um, and so I, I would prefer if all patients came to me that way that you know that have seen yeah. somebody first and had an assessment or have already started to to work on some things um and I, I love this question because this came up very recently um you know here locally in my group that um a young boy was referred to me by his myofunctional therapist who he had been working with and also you know at the same time referred to a wonderful periodontist that we work with that does a lot of uh, phrenectomies and tongue tie releases. So, you know, he, they, the parents have the consultation and, you know, we kind of decide collectively as a group, we're going to expand first and his therapist is going to help him acclimate, you know, to, to these new expanders. Um, you know, they've already gotten several sessions in and then he's going to have his tongue tie release after we've achieved some expansion. 
well, this is one of the individuals that has that lingual frenum attached to the tip, the tip of the tongue. You know, there, there's not much elevation of the tongue going on at all. And so we start with some fixed expanders. So RPE, uh, lower fixed, cement them in, they come unbonded. Now this, this happens to me like once in a while, you know, so I'm like, okay, okay. You know, it happens from time to time. Come back in. We, uh, we do air abrasion on the primary enamel, you know, to, to get better retention, bond them in again. They came unbonded. Like now this doesn't happen to me twice in one kid, you know, now I will say He's very guarded with his airway. It, it was difficult to get good isolation, meaning get the saliva off the teeth, keep things perfectly dry. So I'm like, okay, all right, let's try a third time. They came unbonded. So I said, okay, okay, we're trying something else. Now, the compliance of this individual is, it's so-so, it's so-so. But we had a heart-to-heart. So we went into, um, we, we're now having, we ha- we're having fabricated the bio block uh, stage one for upper and lower. Now, during all this time is passing, the the scheduled date of the release is getting closer and closer because, you know, we expected to have a good amount of expansion at this time. And it honestly ended up being like divine intervention, we think, because the, the release was done. There were no appliances in the mouth. The therapist really prepared this child, you know, had a great success afterwards in, you know, helping, you know, with the exercises and the stretching of the tissues. And um, that tongue was able to maintain a much, much better position than afterwards. So even though that's not what we had planned, the order in which it happened ended up being perfect. And now we have him in upper and lower uh, stage one bio block and expansion is going really well. We're progressing really nicely. Uh, and so it's funny because uh, the three of us are like, yeah, this, we didn't plan it in this order, but like this worked out perfectly. So that's amazing. I love when that happens. And it's, you know, I think I've only ever had maybe one or two patients in our practice that kept pushing out bonded expanders. Um, and, you know, one of them admitted, like it was a, like one was a younger child, maybe seven or so. And, yep. you know, admitted yep. that like he was playing with it a lot and constantly pushing it with his tongue. And, you know, so I think it was just that constant, like it wasn't just, he was playing with anything. The tongue was resting, like that resting force of the tongue, like kind of up against and under the lower. It was, I think he was actually popping out upper and lower. Um, but it was, it was interesting. The dentist was like, what is going on? I've never seen it happen like repeatedly so many times. That's what I said. Yeah. We saw it with an older child as well, but again, you know, it was like two isolated cases. Um, so when you said that, I was like, oh my gosh, because my kids had fixed appliances. They went into like high racks with like a forward growth component on it. Mostly because my youngest one with the deep bite had had like, fruit, uh, excuse me, had had fruit nine times last year. And she was like, all right, we really like need to open her airway. So let's, let's do this. And then, you know, step one, and then we'll, you know, look at step two, but she put planus tracks on the back of my girl's molars to just help, you know, the bite, I guess as well. And I, um, it seems cause they've now come off it. See, and she put them back on and they came off again. She said, you know, they're going to grind them down. So like, I kind of want them to do that anyways. And, you know, we'll, we'll adjust as we need going forward, but now my youngest, um, we started this end of last summer, maybe September, October with her. And she's, she's done with her, you know, rapid expansion, that portion of it. Um, and her bite is so much more improved. It's not deep like it was before. And I'm like, she gets cold and it doesn't turn into croup anymore. And I'm like, okay, step one and two. <laughs> Where are we, yeah. where are we headed next? Right. Um, yeah. So how long do you start in your practice with a that's the famous question. At what yeah. age? Yeah. Um, so uh, my answer will be: I don't have a chronologic age. I have three criteria. Criteria number one is there is enough dentition available that I can put an appliance in. Mm-hmm. So 
there, there has to be, even if we're talking about all primary dentition, there has to be enough eruption of molars that I can clasp or bond to, to something. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, typically in primary dentition, I will put my clasp on the first primary molar, so D. So usually by the time there's enough of that molar available to get retention of a class bond, it means also the second molar, the E, so behind it, so the second primary molar has also erupted, maybe not fully, but it's present. So with most children, that's three years old. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there can be a huge variation on, you know, the, the eruption um, uh, for children of different ages. Uh, so yeah, I would say 85% of my patient population is in the age range from three to 11 years old. Uh, so criteria number one, the <laughs> dentition, the anger. Criteria number two is behavior and cooperation. They have to let me in the mouth. So uh, I have had a two-year-old jump up in my chair, the most mature little person I've ever seen. I'm like, what's real? You know what I mean? And then I've had six years old, six year old that is like, mm -hmm, I don't want to do that. So again, the that varies, right? That's not always the same with chronological age. So enough dentition available, uh, cooperation that allows me to enter the mouth. Uh, and then number three is rationale. So, um, and again, it doesn't matter what age is their rationale, either symptom wise, they've answered eight yeses on the PSQ. Um, they've already done X, Y, Z still, they're still symptomatic or rationale structural wise. Are, is there no spacing between the primary teeth? Is there a, you know, 100% deep anterior bite? Is there, is there a cross bite? You know, do we need space for the tongue? Do we need space for eruption or permanent teeth? So, so enough dentition, cooperation, and rationale. Amazing. I love that. And I, I love that the rationale is included in that too, because, you know, it's, I think we don't talk about this enough. I think there's providers in the space who definitely probably follow similar you know, uh, procedures in terms of like deciding who's a good candidate and who needs, you know, who's maybe not yet a good candidate for these appliances. Um, but I love that the rationale is there too. And it's not just like, oh, because I was taught that or, oh, because they did tongue tie or, oh, because we want to prevent something down the line. It's more like, no, we, we see structure that's actually an issue now and, or they have this host of symptoms. Um, so that's, I think that's really commendable. So I love, I love that. And, and typically they go together you know typically if an individual is symptomatic there's also some structural deficit thank you um i have a random question for you um because this came up and it just I, it just while we were talking and you were mentioning structure it kind of popped into my head so somebody asked me the other day they sent me a picture of a child who was smiling and they said this child normally like at rest jaw appears to be in alignment but when they smile, the dot is deflected, deviated. I don't know what's happening, you know, to know which term to use here. But it, you can see they smile, the mouth is open, and the jaw is jutting left. And it's very visible, you know, that there's something going on. Um, in a child, oh. like, like a three-year-old, like okay. a little like young, young. Yeah. yeah. So is that, like, I guess this person was like, what do I even do? Like, do I recommend an evaluation with me? Do I send them straight to the dentist? Like, you know, obviously I think behaviorally from a struct, you know, a soft tissue standpoint, we're going to have to work with them too. But um, if you were to see that, you know, and like, let's say the parent's not really aware that there are symptoms present, uh, it's a whole different conversation. Um, what would be a good referral or starting point for a case like that? Oh, I, I think someone who's going to assess the function. So I think the myofunctional therapist or the SLP, that, that is my preference. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think structure needs to be looked at too. Uh, you know, is this, is this preference? Is this, you know, deviation habit? Is it muscular imbalance? You know, muscular weakness? Um, that's more what I think of when it's a child that young. Yeah. 
I start, you know, as they get older to think of like, okay, is is there, you know, joint TMJ structural alterations? You know, do we have um, the condyle kind of moving within the fossa, moving along the articular eminence differently because of a disc displacement or, you know, something like that? And, but for, for a three-year-old, I would say, let's get their function assessed first. Thank you. That's, I love, I love hearing that. Cause I mean, that my, was my recommendation. I was like, well, I would want to kind of get my hands on the face and want to see, like, you want to watch the child speak. I want to watch them chew yeah. and swallow. Yeah. I want to see yeah. what's happening during that process. And then I want to see if it's, you know, because we do a lot of doll work and are, you know, and at that age too, it's, we really take more of like a sensory oral motor approach. I call it like feeding with a twist of uh, tots and Mayo. Like we're basically taking all this information we've learned and applying it to our pediatric oral motor feeding patients. Um, and they don't all come in with feeding issues. A lot of them come in with, you know, other concerns and we go, okay, let's back up because it's still that similar approach to working with the soft tissue and looking at function and that whole, you know, functional evaluation and approach to treatment. So, um, so thank you for that. It's very uh, reassuring that my thought process also was on the right track. Um, is there anything else that we haven't discussed today that you wanna share with us? Oh gosh, great question. I feel like I've been talking your ear off, like going no, I love too, it that. too many tangents. I <laughs> know, it was so good. So good. So so tell us, tell us where they can find you um, and your website. We'll also put that in the show notes, but let us know. Sure. So um, I practice in the Western suburbs of Chicago. So Downers Grove, where my practice is located. Um, it's called Air Dental and I'm Courtney Donko. So um, Haley will link the, the practice website in the notes. And, you know, if you have uh, any concerns or questions, give us a call. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Courtney. This has been so much fun. And I feel like I learned a little bit from you today, even just in describing, you know, the whole, um, that article you're talking about with mandibular rotation. And, you know, I think these concepts are really going to be a little bit mind blowing for some people. So thank you for sharing that knowledge with us. And I look forward to chatting with you more in the future. Thank you, Hallie. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you want to hear more of these Mayo Tots airway and feeding related episodes, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or pledge a small amount on patreon.com forward slash the untethered podcast. If you found value, others you know in this space will too. So be sure to share this episode on your social media platforms and join us over on Facebook, on my Facebook page at Hallie Balkan Biz, on Instagram at, at Hallie Balkan, and you can head over to the untetheredpodcast.com to grab a copy of the show notes um, where you can also subscribe to be kept up to date on the latest podcast episodes. 